So you have this highly sophisticated and powerful firewall on your network with all the bells and whistles turned on. And considering how much it costs, you have a reasonable amount of confidence that it does what it says it does. As we shop around for firewalls and security devices, we often overlook the most simplest question, can it be bypassed? The answer might surprise you. In today's video, we're going to look at a popular open source tool called HTTP Evader to see how easy it can be to evade a next gen firewall. But most importantly, we're going to look at five ways to defend against them. I'm Andy with the CISO Perspective, and today's video is all about firewall evasion, five defensive techniques. HTTP Evader is a fantastic open source tool for testing your firewall or UTM device against some of the most effective evasion techniques in the wild. Used by some of the top vendors and testing agency, Evader attempts to bypass your firewall's inspection by delivering over 700 different evasion techniques via HTTP or HTTPS. While some of the specific techniques used by Vader are too many to list, the vast majority can be grouped into the following categories. Protocol misuse, compression, encoding, chunk transfer, and tunneling. The method in which these techniques used to bypass security inspection can vary. Some rely on not adhering to RFC guidelines in an effort to throw off what the firewall expects to see in a flow. Others try to hide payload through the protocol itself, or break it into smaller chunks so that it cannot be seen or it doesn't look like malware individually. To illustrate how easy it is to evade malware via HTTP, I ran a couple of different tests using HTTP Evader. One with a traditional firewall and a second with a next-gen firewall using default values. The next-gen firewall is enabled as a layer 7 application firewall with IPS and antivirus enabled. Our first test using the regular firewall went about as bad as you would expect it to go. Almost every single evasion technique was successful, and the test stopped after 100 successful evasion techniques because there's little in the way of checking beyond layer 4. Our second test with the next-gen firewall performed much better even while using default values. However, even still, 37 evasion techniques were ultimately successful and snuck past to deliver the malware. Our goal in this video is to try to get that number down to zero or as low as possible using the tools available in almost any modern next-gen firewall. The first item on our list is to make sure you have the protocol analyzer feature enabled on your firewall. This is usually a component of most layer 7 firewalls, but it's not always enabled or not always used correctly in your firewall policies. Protocol analyzer can be called different things depending on the vendor, but it should always be about two major things. Analyzing protocols for RFC compliancy and ensuring that they're running over the ports that you expect them to run on. A really simple evasion technique that works surprisingly well on most modern next-gen firewalls is to move malicious payload into different sections of the header or the footer. With portions of the malware being in the header, the rest of the body looks clean and therefore circumvents inspection. Protocol enforcement should catch non-RFC compliant protocols and block them or alert. While we're on the topic of protocols, if you have no need for QUIC or older HTTP versions, disable them altogether. QUIC is an experimental protocol by Google, which is typically not scanned by modern security devices and therefore a viable mechanism for attackers to evade detection. Like Protocol Analyzer, Protocol Enforcement is usually a component of a Layer 7 firewall and it's intended to make sure that common protocols are running over the standard ports. On most vendors, this option comes disabled by default, so as to not cause problems in networks where applications may be running on non-standard ports. However, this is another common avenue for malware to operate in. For example, when a host is infected with malware and needs to reach back to its command and control server, it typically needs to resolve the IP address using DNS. But going over port 53 is an obvious red flag and may not resolve at all if the network has some version of DNS filtering. However, querying out to a DNS resolver over a standard port like port 80 has a much higher success rate. That's why locking down applications to standard ports can deter this type of evasion by keeping applications on ports you expect them to be on. Next time an infected host tries to reach out via non-standard port, the blocked request should redirect the malware into using a standard port where you can detect the communication via normal inspection methods. The first two items on our list were geared towards making sure that protocols are compliant to RFC standards, but we're going to need an additional layer of defense against more sophisticated evasion techniques. This is where our IPS engine will be able to assist, by looking beyond the protocol and into the payload and methods where the data may be hidden. I'm a firm believer that any signature-based system should be the last line of defense, but given that we're talking about a limited amount of evasions as opposed to vulnerabilities, they work very well for these type of use cases. The specific signature names will vary by vendor to vendor, but the attacks your signature should be protecting against should include the following. Malformed HTTP request, HTTP char set encoding, HTTP request evasion, HTTP content encoding deflate spoofing, HTTP headers end with, HTTP unknown tunneling, TCP inconsistent retransmissions, 
and TCL TTL evasion. I wouldn't worry much about the names or the quantity of the signatures, as one generic signature could encompass many different techniques. As long as you have the vendor version of these specific signatures, you should have a good level of protection. If you're on a FortiGate next-gen firewall, these signatures can be used to protect against the HTTP evasions that I just mentioned above. Notice how some of these default values on the signatures are set to pass by default. The trade-off in changing these to block can be more false positives on your network. My recommendation is to keep these in monitor mode on your network for a few days while you get a sense for what is legitimate traffic. Create bypass rules as necessary. Now, with all three of these safeguards in place, I reran the HTTP evader test and I got zero evasions. The only two alerts were around invalid response to malware test files, which is fine as long as the malware is blocked. All in all, over 700 of the most used evasion techniques blocked via HTTP just by using these three simple techniques that can be found on almost any next-gen firewall. Now, that's all good and well, but there's a huge blind spot you may be ignoring by only inspecting traffic in the clear text. According to Google's transparency report, as much as 96% of the web traffic delivered over Chrome was using HTTPS, and the same holds true for malware attempting to reach out from inside your network. Sophos recently published a report that stated 23% of malware that attempted to make a network connection was using HTTPS. That is a growing trend that will only continue to rise because it's an effective communication technique to get back to a command and control server. Ultimately, no matter how good of a security device you have, evading it can be as simple as tunneling traffic out via SSL connection. That's why the fourth item on our list is to use SSL deep packet inspection to view the contents that go inside an SSL or TLS connection. In order to successfully block SSL evasion, we need to consider two scenarios, malware getting in your network and malware communicating out from your network. Both of these require us to enable SSL deep packet inspection on the appropriate firewall rules. However, deploying SSL DPI can be very complex. For starters, the security device, in our case the next-gen firewall, has to man in the middle every SSL connection it sees. This works by presenting the user that originally requested an HTTPS site with a certificate that is signed by the security device itself. It then creates a separate SSL connection to the destination web server, therefore creating two separate connections between the client and the server, all the while the client not being able to see that there's a device in the middle. The firewall typically acts as an intermediary CA that signs every certificate presented back to the user. And if you know anything about PKI, this means that the user has to have the intermediary CA marked as trusted. And while we won't get into specifics of how to set up that trust, for our purpose, let's assume that intermediary CA has already been imported into the user's trusted CA store. Now, every time an SSL or TLS connection is requested, the firewall intercepts, establishes its own SSL TLS connection back to the server, and now inspects packets as they go through that tunnel. When malware or fireless attacks are presented to the destination server, it's the firewall that's actually on the receiving end, acting as a proxy, which could then block the request before ever getting to the user. The same idea applies for malware that's already made it inside your network and now attempts to communicate out. With SSL DPI, the firewall can intercept that connection to see and block suspicious callbacks to a command and control server. A popular technique to prevent deep packet inspection on SSL connections is to use certificate pinning. Certificate pinning stores a certificate hash on the application itself and it compares it against a certificate that's being presented by the server. If they don't match because the firewall is intercepting it, the connection doesn't establish. For malware that uses certificate pinning, they generally have two options, either drop the connection or attempt to tunnel out using another mechanism. That brings us to our fifth and final point on preventing firewall evasions, and that's to set up a multi-layered approach in blocking proxies. The first measure is to block known command and control servers at the layer 3 level. This can be done via threat intel feeds which you can import and make into an ACL, or by using a botnet package that is typically a signature based approach on your next gen firewall. Next we're going to use application identification to block the proxy avoidance category and the Tor applications from any outbound connections. If there's a specific need for your users on these applications, you can always make an exempt rule to allow those users or subnets from being inspected. Now our third layer is going to be leveraging our IPS to block tunneling data traffic inside of other protocols. The idea here is to use a standard protocol like HTTP, DNS, or ping to send or receive data. When the IPS sees unknown data in parts of the protocol that it does not belong, it will alert and block those attempts to communicate out. It's also worth mentioning that a sophisticated attacker with little research into your network can use something called cache bypass method to trick your firewall into believing it's an alternative application. 
the attacker would have to know the kind of firewall vendor that's being used, then research that application and use it as a decoy. It can craft the malware in such a way that it tricks a firewall into thinking that it's part of the application. So typically the header and parts of the payload are written with just enough code that makes it look like it's a legitimate application. Inside, malware is being hidden, but the firewall continues to think that it's an allowed application going through the network. Now before we wrap up, there's a bonus content that I wanted to mention, and that's polymorphic malware and fragmented packet evasion. Both of these evasion techniques take advantage of packet by packet inspection, typically called flow mode on firewalls. Flow mode has become a popular choice of inspection on modern next-gen firewalls. Flow mode works by inspecting each packet as it arrives at the firewall. In most scenarios, it has a very high rate of detection, but you also run the risk of an attacker chunking or fragmenting parts of the packets in such a way that it makes the individual packets look benign. It's only when they're defragmented or put back together that you see the full picture of what's actually being sent in the network. That's where proxying the entire file has a major advantage. With proxy mode, next-gen firewalls grab and reconstruct all packets in a flow before inspecting and sending back to the client. This type of inspection is more accurate, but it also requires more resources. So that does it for this video, you guys, and I hope you found it informative. As always, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to stay on top of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective, and make sure you visit us at thecisoperspective.com.